we're going to conclude our series, of course, that we're in this week. It's called Refresh. Has anyone gotten anything out of this so far? All month long, we've been talking about how to get refreshment, and we started the series off on January 1st in the middle of like a monsoon. All the power was out in town. The only power in the whole city was right here in the church because we have the power. And God was like favoring us. I don't know why. But this series, we've been talking about this, this verse that's a life verse for a lot of people. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not depend on your own understanding. Seek his will in all you do, and he will show you which path to take. Some will say, it's a process. It's a process. It is a process. You know, you got to learn to trust the Lord. You got to learn to trust anybody. You got to learn to trust anything. As the faithfulness is shown, as we see people's faithfulness, as we see God's faithfulness, and we see him come through time and time again, we learn that he's dependable. We learn that we can count on him. But the idea around the series, around refresh, was really around that, that circle in the top of your internet browser. You know, the one, the refresh button. Come on, somebody. The refresh button. The internet, man. What a blessing. What a blessing. Kids these days, let me, let me talk to the grown-ups in the house today. Grown-ups, grown-ups, do you remember how hard it was to try and find a movie time? Man, you had to take out this, you had to take out this thing. It's like a tablet, but lighter. It's all black and white. It's called a newspaper. Newspaper, and you had to spread it out over your uh, coffee table there or your kitchen table, and you had to look through, and like the whole screen is one piece. Picture this the whole screen is one piece, and it's really light though. And you had to look for your times. Kids these days won't understand what it's like. And then, if you're from a certain generation, a certain generation, you might remember the movie Hotline. Raise your hand at me if you remember. You don't want to admit it, do you? All right, I got you, I got you. And it goes like something like this. Lord of the Rings, playing at 9.15, 11.30, and it would just take forever, and, and God forbid you were trying to like find out times for Zootopia, because it's in alphabetical order, you had to be on the phone for like 25 minutes, slightly before my time, but not that much. I look younger than I really am. It's okay. It's okay. And to top all that off, there are people in this church right now, today, kids these days, will never understand the pain and the glory of this sound. <laughs> no joke, no joke, no joke. Someone from my production team right here, I won't, I won't name names. I said, hey, can you find the dial-up sound? They're like, the what? The church is getting younger, y'all. It's okay. It's a good thing. It's what we want to see. It's what we want to see. Man, like 300 kilobytes of 800 kilobytes. Man, like what's a kilobyte? Oh, my gosh. <laughs> and the internet back then, it was like, man, the fact that I can get on the internet is good enough. But nowadays, it's like it's too slow. It's too slow. Internet's not fast enough. I want to stream movies on an airplane. What do you mean I can't watch movies on an airplane? Like, what are you complaining about, man? It's too slow. And so we would do things, we'd click that refresh button over and over again, and sometimes we got more faith in the internet will refresh than we have faith that God will refresh us if we remain in him and keep on going, keep on tapping, keep on saying, God, I need your refreshment. We got more faith in our phones and in Google than we do the one who is the source of all knowledge and all refreshment. No, that's not the way I want to live. I want to, I want to count on him because Jesus said it this way, John 15. He says, remain in me, remain in me, stay steadfast in me, my word, and I will remain in you. For a branch cannot produce fruit if severed from the vine, right? We are in Lodi, lots of vines around here. So you understand if you take a branch off the vine, it's dead, all right? It's firewood. Take it off the vine. It will not be fruitful unless you remain in me. Yes, Jesus says, I am the vine. You are the branches. Those who remain in me and I in them will produce much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. nothing. We can't do anything good. That's what he means. It's, there's nothing good that can come from our life. It may look good on the surface. It may look good to your coworkers, but there's nothing truly good that can come from us unless we're connected to the vine, unless we're connected to Jesus and looking to him for our source. When he's our supplier, everything that flows from us is a good thing. That's a great place to say amen. Amen. We can't get refreshed without God. People who try to get refreshed without God will end up frustrated. And some of you know what that feels like. You've tried it your own way. 
Man, come on, where are my real people at? The real people in the world that have, have tried it. Man, I've tried the relationships. Man, I've tried the substances. I've tried, I've tried all of it. And it always leaves me wanting. It always leaves me feeling unsatisfied. But you know what? Um, I got an illustration for this about remaining in Jesus. My office, my actual office is in my garage. I had to furnish it, had to go down and get scraps of carpet, put it on the bottom of my, my, my garage floor. And so I'm basically out in the driveway. You know, I'm one garage door away from being in the driveway. That's where I do my work. That's where my wife has banished me, is out to the garage. And I'm out there, and I'm far from the, which one is the one that gives your phone the internet, the router or the modem? You, nobody knows. It's, it doesn't matter. It's the one that beeps, Pastor, I'm not sure. It's just, as long as it's working. So I'm far from my router. I think it's the router. And so I'm out there. I'm uploading a short or I'm doing something on the internet. I need to upload, download something. And I got one little tiny bar on that upside down triangle of joy. You know, the one, the Wi-Fi. I got one little bar. And, and I don't see it right away because it's up in the top. So I'm, I'm doing my thing and the connection is slow. I got a bad connection. And then I realize, oh, yeah, stand up off my tushy, get up into the house, stand in my living room, bring, done. Because I got fast internet, yo. I work from home. I pay for some fast internet. But if I'm far away from it, if I'm not close enough to the source, my connection, well, it's not good for my neighbors. It's not good for people in my driveway. You have still got to be close to the source to get the refreshment that you need. Move closer to God if you want a better connection. If you need more refreshment, get closer to God, amen? James, the half-brother of Jesus, same mother, different fathers. Uh, it's, all right. It didn't last. It's fine. It's fine. Whatever. James, his name's James, half-brother. Mary was his mother as well. He, he wrote this in James, his, his book, the chapter 4, chapter 8, verse said, come close to God, and God will come close to you. In other words, if you do things his way, it goes on in that verse to say, repent. Like, don't try and do it your own way. Do it God's way, and you will, be, you will find what you're looking for. He will come close to you. God freely lets us connect with him. No password required, but there's a problem. When's the last time you saw someone put their Wi-Fi password on a yard sign in their front yard? Never. They hide it from you. They actually make the password so you can't get it, right? Because people intuitively know that the more people that jump on your connection, the slower it's going to be. And we take that mentality into our spirituality, and we don't allow people close to us because the more people that are close to me, the more I'm trying to oh, go to a life group, man, that's just going to slow me down. That's just going to hold me up. If I have to invest in people, if I have to make relationships with people, if I have to actually do what the Bible says and love one another, man, just, I, can, I got this on my own because we take that mentality of the less people that are around me, the faster I can go. But that is faulty thinking. It's not biblical. It's not spiritual. That's but as we take that thinking into our spirituality, we take it in there. Um, we withhold ourselves. Now, you've heard of the, the Last Supper, you know, the communion story, the Last Supper. They're up there in the room. This is my body. Brain. That's the last, the last Supper. Well, in John 21, there's a story of the Last Breakfast. The Last Breakfast where Jesus raised, he's raised from the dead. He, he's appearing to all of his disciples. And he's, you know, he meets up with Peter who's gone back to his old career of fishing. He's out there on the water. And Jesus, just like when he met him, said, hey, let down your nets for another catch. Get some fish out. And they come out and they have the Last Breakfast, breakfast fish sticks. Fish sticks for breakfast. I, don't, I mean, hey, you know, back then it's all good. You know, some tartar sauce right there. You know the fast is lifted, right? That actually sounds kind of good right now. Some deep fried fish sticks. Come on. Fast is over, right, everybody? 21 days, man. That's why. Hey, man, let's go. That was one way to announce it. The fast is lifted, everyone. Go get some fish sticks. No joke. There's someone from our team who, who is fasting coffee for 21 days. I said, I said, girl, I'd rather fast food. I'd rather not eat any food at all than give up coffee. That would be painful. She did it, though. She's a, she's a rock star. Anyways, this is the story of the last breakfast I want to I wanna teach you about right here. Jesus asks Peter three times, do you love me? Of course I love you. And each time, Jesus responds with this, feed my sheep. And there's something in the Bible. I don't have time to go into it. I have so much I want to cover. But like that repetition, holy, holy, holy. There's actually, there's some literary principles, poetic, that those three is meant to just be like, oh, 
belly, like really big. It, it's the three times for the bigness. I don't have time to get into it, but he asked him three times, and it's kind of like a sign. It's kind of like he's trying to, trying to build it into Peter's thinking, Peter, do you love me? Yeah, I love you. Feed my sheep. Peter, do you love me? Feed my lambs. Peter, do you love me? Feed my sheep. Hmm. What, what, what's being said here? Jesus is saying, you can run around and do ministry activities until you're blue in the face. You can show up to church. You can show up to life groups. You can sign up for the paper. You can serve at the outreach. You can do whatever you want. But if you don't love and feed the needs and nurture of people, Jesus, at the end of the day, will not feel loved. That's what he said to Peter. Do you love me? Feed my sheep. Do you love me? Then hear. Show me you love me. Feed my sheep. If you love me, you feed my sheep. God never intended the good things that he did for you, does for you, to ever stop with you. Amen. 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 He never intended it to stop with you. Listen to this, Matthew 28. This is the great commission. The great commission of Jesus. These are like his last words to his disciples. So important, right? Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I've given you. Do this with these people. And then be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Now, this, is my, this might be reaching on my part, but I'm, I'm thinking about all this. I'm thinking about life groups starting. I'm thinking about how the fact that we're supposed to spend our lives together like this. And the last commission of Jesus is, could be summed up this way. You go be with people, and I'll be with you. It's powerful. It's powerful. You go be with people, baptize them, uh, teach them. Be with them, just show them all nations. Go be with them, and I'll be with you. Peter, do you love me? Feed my sheep. Go, make disciples. It's it's so much more important than we think it is. Our culture, our society is so me-focused. It's so self-centered. It's celebrated. You know, you just gotta focus on you. You know, just stay home. Just stay home. You are the most important person in your life, you know, just like right here, you know, and there's some truth, like you can't take care of anybody else if you're not taken care of. I I understand all that. But Jesus seems to think like we're going to be taken care of just fine if we get outside of ourselves and begin loving and taking care of the needs and nurture of people. I feel like a lot of times uh, we're acting like in our faith, in our faith, we're acting like third graders, (laughs) third graders, not just any third graders, third graders who are in PE, and the PE teacher said, okay, everybody, time to go get a drink. Have you ever seen a group of third graders be released all at one time to go get a drink? I don't know about the little girls, probably very polite, but the boys, oh, elbows flying, like, mm, oh, I'm like knocking kids out, getting out of the way, pushing them down. I get there first, and I'm like kicking them out of the way, trying to get a drink, refreshing myself with no concern with the refreshment needs of others. That's how, in our faith, sometimes we act that way. It's all about us. It's all about me. I need to just take care of me. It's all about me, me, me. Get out of my way so that I can focus on me. Life groups means we get outside of ourselves and we actually burden ourselves a little bit for the needs and nurture of others. You ever heard that scripture? That scripture in the Bible that said, God helps those who help themselves. You ever heard that scripture? Raise your hand if you've heard that scripture before. Yep. I, was, um, I, was, I was preaching this. It's not, it's not in the Bible. It's not a scripture. I, I got some of people are like, we are going to stone him if he thinks that's a scripture. <laughs> it's just an illustration, guys. I'm just trying to paint the picture. I preach this message. I preach my messages every Tuesday night to a group of uh, Salvation Army guys in Stockton. I just take it, you know, I'm almost done by then, and Monday, Tuesday, I'm getting done, and as I'm finishing up my message, I'll take it down there, and I'll just, I'll just share it with them, you know, because it's a group, I can practice and kind of say it out loud, and they, they get fresh word every single time, and I brought that up, and I, I, I told them, hey, that's not a scripture, God helps those who help themselves, and not in the word, it's actually quite opposite, it's God helps those who, who live freely and give generously and help others, God helps them, and this guy from a certain generation, came up to me and was livid. He's like, no, this, no, you have to, you, you, can't, you can't do, you have to, you, it's, you, if you have to take, you can't be lazy. I'm like, laziness was not the subject. I wasn't talking about laziness. Obviously, you're not supposed to be lazy, but somehow along the way, we've been taught and trained, God helps those who helps themselves. 
And I have been adamantly told to my face, you have to teach people that. Not by pastors, not by people who call themselves believers, but just haven't been trained or haven't been taught. That's not actually the scripture. It's actually the opposite. No, the opposite is true. He helps people who helps others. He, he truly helps people. And I'm not, this is not negligence. I'm not giving permission for negligence or laziness. But God favors and honors and blesses people who give outside of themselves. Listen to the scripture. Who sow into the kingdom. Listen to the scripture. We're going to camp on this scripture for a little while. This is in your notes. Proverbs 11.25. The generous, they will prosper. The generous will prosper. Those who refresh others. Get out of my way. I don't got time for all that life group stuff. I'm busy working. I'm busy whatever. I got my family. You know, I need to see them. The excuses are, and I'm not saying seeing your family's bad. Obviously. I hope that's obvious. You have to prioritize your family. I think there's a lot more room in your life for others than Sometimes we lead on. It's a priority. Peter, do you love me? Feed my sheep. Those who refresh others will themselves be refreshed. You see how powerful this is? You see how big of a deal this really is? Why we talk about life groups for weeks and weeks and weeks and got all these groups going every single day of the week, men's, women's, couples, date knives, Bible studies, golf groups, like just anything we can do to get people together because it's primary is primary. What happens if we don't take this advice, though? That's what I want to talk about. If we don't take the advice of Proverbs, this is a book of wisdom, by the way. Proverbs 11, 25, the generous will prosper. Those who refresh others will themselves be refreshed. If we don't do this, this is without Proverbs 25. Write this down in your notes. Take notes. says, we become self-centered. That's obvious. And it's celebrated. And it's, if not celebrated, it's definitely ignored. It's like, all right, that's normal to become self-centered. I call it the selfie syndrome. You know, when you're on your... Your Instagram, and it's nothing but duck faces, which is not just girls, by the way. I know a lot of brothers. It's out there, man. It's weird, okay? It's weird. And if you you live that way for too long, everything's focused on me. Camera's pointed back to me. Everything's kind of about me. I'm just taking care of me. You know, you can stand near me, you know, and maybe some of my greatness will drip on you, but I'm I'm, I'm taking care of me. We're self-centered. Self-centered. If we do that too long, you become lonely. We become lonely. It's in your notes. This is important progression that I want you to understand and know. We become lonely. Why? Because it's all about you all the time. Think about how lonely that gets over time. Always receiving, never giving. Um, The Dead Sea. You heard the Dead Sea over in Israel. It's called the Dead Sea for a great reason. Um, It's 32% salt. 32% salt water. You're like, that's not, I mean, whatever. For context, the ocean is 3%. It's 10 times, have you ever tried to drink the ocean? It's like, oh, so awful, right? That's 3% salt. The Dead Sea, 32% salt. So why, why is the Dead Sea so salty? Why is it so salty? Listen to this. If you try to jump into the Dead Sea, you would float. I'm I'm, I'm fixing to find out. Pretty soon I want to go to Israel this year, November. I'm I'm not counting my, you know, chickens before they hatch. You know, I've been trying to go since 2020. Can I I get a, oh. Yeah, yeah, well, the Dead Sea, I, I, I want to see it. I want to try this out, but nothing can live there. Nothing can live in the Dead Sea. It's why it's called the Dead Sea. Why is it so salty? Because it has inlets. There's ocean water flowing in, salt water flowing in, but there's no outlets. There's no outlets. So the sun is beating down on it. The water's evaporating, but the salt just stays. And so it, over time, just gets saltier and saltier and saltier, always receiving, never giving, saltier and saltier, always receiving, never giving, and it's dead inside because of that. God painted us an actual real life picture, an ocean to describe what happens if we live this way. We become lonely. And if you live this way for too long, you get that saltiness, that bitter beer face going on, and you become isolated. That also ages me. Dude, that joke right there ages me and you if you laughed at it. I see you. I see you. We become isolated if we live that way. You walk into rooms and no one says hi. You're not saying hi to anybody else because you're so salty, but that's what you're thinking. How come no one's saying hi to me? And you got this look on your face all sour. You know, and this is where it gets perpetual too. So the saltiness, you know, you become 
you know, more isolated, you become more lonely, more, more salty, more isolated, more salty, more isolated, perpetual. It, just, it gets worse and worse, just like the Dead Sea. It gets worse and worse and worse. And before too long, you become truly depressed. And I'm not saying every depressed person is, like, mad or salty. But when you find yourself here, many people forget about the really ancient root cause that we started with. The generous will prosper those who refresh others. You're in your depression, and you're like, what could fix this depression? Maybe some medication, maybe some doctors. And I have nothing wrong with doctors or medication. I've seen doctors, been prescribed medication. I've seen counselors. I've done all the things they want to do. Thank God. Thank God for doctors and medications. But some of you out here could cure your depression if you just received the wisdom of the great physician that says, if you refresh others, you yourself will be refreshed. It's wisdom. It's God's wisdom, and because we haven't, just because we never knew, because we didn't live this way, because we didn't prioritize refreshing others, being around people, taking care of the needs and nurtures of others, we've been focusing ourselves to try and fix ourselves, but we inevitably get worse and worse and worse because we're just so focused on ourselves. Go to a life group. <laughs> I'm, I'm serious. I'm serious. Sign up for one. This is more important than you think it is. So what's the solution? This is in your notes. The solution, Genesis 2, 18. It says, it's not good for man to be alone. Not good. There it is, right there, black and white. It's not good. And of course, the greatest invention ever created, the woman, was created right after that. But that's that's good right there. It's not good for man to be alone. Put a pin in that. It goes on to say, Ecclesiastes 4, 9 and 10, two people are better off than one, for they can help each other succeed. If one person falls, the other can reach out and help, but someone who falls alone is in real trouble. We often look at a verse like that. We often look at a verse like that, and we focus on the one who needs the help. But what if here at Lifeline Church, we made our prayer, Lord, help me be the one who does the lifting. Help me be the one who who is a lifeline to others. And that's how I get my refreshment, understanding, knowing that as I'm helping others, I'm getting stronger. My faith is growing. As I just take care of the needs and nurtures of others, every single person in this room can engage in this. You are not too young in the Lord. You are not too new in your church. I don't care if this is your first visit. You have it in you to take care of the needs and nurtures of others, and you can get refreshment doing that just right now, today. Anytime I'm feeling bad, I'll just, this is not in my notes, but I'm just gonna give it to you. Anytime I'm not feeling good, because sometimes I just don't feel good. You know what I do? I text somebody. Thanks for asking. I text them, (laughs) and I say, hey, I'm thinking about you. I'm praying for you. If there's anything I could pray for you about, let me know. Gets me right out of here gets me right out of here, and I start refreshing others, and it blesses me every time. It blesses me every time. I don't want to tell you how many times I've had to do that, but I've had to do it. And why, does it, why, why, why do you have to be a pastor to have that? Why do you got to be a pastor to do that? Uh, you don't. You can do this. You can do that. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to continue to explain why this is so important. Luke this happened, and while Jesus was preaching once, he was actively preaching, just like I'm preaching right now to a group like this, As he was preaching, this happened. Some men came in carrying a paralyzed man on a sleeping mat. Everyone say mat. Mat. It's an important word for us. They tried to take him inside to Jesus, but it was so, imagine, it's so crowded in here they can't get in. But they couldn't reach him because of the crowd. So, flip two pages. Then they went up to the roof, took off some tiles. Come on, somebody. (laughs) Took off some tiles and lowered the sick man down on his down into the crowd right in front of Jesus. I want you to picture this. You're sitting here listening to a, a nice message on a Sunday morning, all right? And some dust falls in your hair. And you see it. It's like coming down right here, and you're like, wait a minute, wait, wait, what's that? You, you think, surely, surely there's nothing above my head right now. You look up, and a man <laughs> is descending from a freshly cut hole in, in the roof, and he's coming at you. I don't know what you would say, but I'm 78% sure it wouldn't be clean language coming out of my mouth. I'd be like, okay, there's a man coming down at me right now. What did Jesus do? He said, stop the production, and he healed the man right there. Healed him right then, right there, and, that's, and this is what we do. In stories like this, we focus on the miracle. 
the one who needed the help. But what I was struck by when I was reading this passage during the week, what I was struck by was the brothers up on the roof. Hey, can you imagine? Like you, you got the guy, you picked him up, you and I'm going to guess like four, four guys, and they're like carrying him. Oh, he's not there. Come on, let's... How did they get him up on the roof? Like, you're like one-handed, you're carrying up there, you cut the hole. You're looking down the hole, and you're like, they, he did it! He did it! He said, look, he's walking! Oh, my God! Oh, my God! And they're like, they're like high-fiving, chest-bumping, they're like celebrating. Think about what it was like to be the guys up there. Pretty cool. I want to be that guy. All right, I may not need to get healed from paralysis so often, but I want to be that guy on the roof. Don't you? I want to be the one giving the lifeline. I want to be the one that's bringing people close to Jesus. Now, this is, this is kind of harsh, uh, and I'm going to share with you. Um, I set you up with some laughs, but what I'm going to share with you right now is a little, a little bit tougher. But I want you to hear, because you came to church to hear, like, the truth, right? And to hear, like, I want to I wanna be told, like, really what's really going on. You didn't want me to just high-five you when you're drowning. You want me to actually pick you up. I get it. I get it. But I've, I've, got, a, I've got a theory. It is a theory. It's just a theory. So I don't want to get any emails about this, okay? No emails tomorrow. It's just I'm just theorizing in front of you. Disclosure done. There's two positions on earth, I believe. Just like there's two kingdoms, there's the kingdom of light and the kingdom of darkness. I believe there's two positions that we can take in the kingdom of God. You are either on the mat or you are carrying the mat. I don't believe there's any in between. Because if you read this story, it would take you minutes to read this actual whole story. To read the whole chapter, it would take you a few minutes. You can do it yourself. But I'm just going to break it down to you. There was other people in the room that day. The Pharisees. The Pharisees. Who, they knew a lot, man. They were really smart. They understood the law. They, they were there. They were doing the best they could. But they, they missed the mark. You know, they just, they, their Messiah was right there. They just couldn't see it. You know, bless them. They just, couldn't, they just didn't see it. They couldn't see it. Whatever. They were on the mat and didn't realize it. They were the ones that actually needed to get brought closer to Jesus. At least the paralyzed man knew he needed help. Sometimes... When our life looks good, we can trick ourselves into thinking we don't need the help. I, so what I'm saying to you is this. We are either bringing people close to Jesus, or you might need to get closer to Jesus than you think you are. If you're not bringing, Peter, do you love me? Then feed my sheep. There's people out there lost and hurting. Only you can reach them. Your pastor doesn't work with them. You do. They're not their next door neighbors. You are. You are either bringing people Close to Jesus, you may not be as close to him as you think you are. Okay, tough thing over. Tough thing over. <laughs> I'll leave that right there, and you can just do sniff, sniff around and see if it works for you. <laughs> Serious, though. And Luke 25, or, or Luke 5, same, same passage. Jesus turned to the paralyzed man and said, stand up, pick up your, and walk, and go home. And immediately, as everyone watched, the man jumped up. Picked up his mat. As soon as he was done being on the mat, what did he do? He picked it up. You are either on the mat or you are carrying the mat. You are either needing to get like free from something big and needing to have salvation in your life, or you go right from there. Once you get liberated, this man went straight from being paralyzed on the mat to being liberated carrying the mat. Pick up your mat, ladies and gentlemen. Pick up your mat. Take care of the needs and nurture of people. Get into a life group and start caring about the people in your city. Lodi, man, Stockton, Galt, Lockford. There is a lot of people in this community. We are not close to being done reaching them all. You know this church is bigger than it looks right now, right? You, know, you understand that, right? That we're not only going to just ever have one service. We're not only going to ever be in one location. Because God is on the move here. He's growing us. If, but we, we, we have to understand this. Because he's not going to do it just for our ego, just for our pride. You know why he'll do it? Peter, do you love me? Feed my sheep. We care about people. We changed our name to Lifeline. After Tiffany and I took over this church, it was just like a few people, you know, a handful of families. And when we took over, after we got acclimated a little bit, figured out that we weren't going to die <laughs> from being pastors. <laughs> Tiffany was 24, I was 27. I had been in the church for... For three years, been saved for five. I was like, are you guys sure you want me to do this? 
once we figured out we were going to survive, we, we started thinking really more seriously about the name that people would understand us by, the people that people would call us by. There's a name here on Hutchins where people drive by it every day, and we changed our name to Lifeline. Why? We wanted to be known as a people that give a lifeline to others, that give, bring people close to Jesus, that pick up the mat, that don't mind getting their hands dirty, that don't mind getting on their hands and knees where the people that need us most. It's hard. It's hard. Ten years we've been past. It's hard to do. I'm not telling you it's easy. It's hard to do. But Peter, do you love me? Do you love me? I, Lord, here in front of this, these people, I love you. And he would say to me, as he would say to you, feed my sheep. You have to know something, that your hurting friends can't always get to Jesus on their own. They can't. They need you. They need you. God will use someone. He intends to use you. All right? It's theologically not very sound to say that God needs anything, but God wants to use you. He, he, he longs to use you. You're fulfilling your purpose when you go outside of your way to bring someone close to Jesus. It could be as simple as just casually inviting someone to church. Or it can be as significant as praying with your hands on them. It can, it can look a lot of different ways. But your hurting friends need you. Your hurting coworkers, they need you. They definitely need you. They need God, and God wants to use you. They need you to be helping, carrying, being inconvenienced, going out of their way, bringing people close to Jesus. Pick up the mats. Come on, somebody, let's go. I want to show you this because my, my, I'm not really myself if I'm not doing an illustration like this. So I got a mat up here. I know you guys can't see it. This is actually a towel. It's not really a mat. It's a towel, but it's going to work out. And I got one good, strong friend. Come on up here, Pastor Mark. I want to, sh I want to show the people something because I, I'm a guy with a lot of problems, all right? I got a lot of problems. I got anxiety. I got stress. I got worries. I got concerns. I got whatever. And you know, I just need one good, strong brother to pick me up. Come on. Does this guy look strong in his 49er jersey right now? He looks pretty good. All right, let's see if he can do it. Let's see if he can do it. Ooh! Hey, I've been fasting, but I'm not that light, okay? All right, that's good. That's good. Now, even if he could do it, even if he could do it, um, he wouldn't be able to do it very long. He would probably hurt himself. Yeah. It would be extremely yeah. uncomfortable. <laughs> He's like, yeah, I'm telling you, actually, I kind of felt something right now. But let's get a few more brothers. Uh, let's get a few more brothers up here. Come on, strong man. Oh, my goodness. Okay. Okay, we got two. Maybe let's make it five. Come on, everybody. Let me show you the power of life groups. What one person couldn't handle on their own, Many people can handle quite easily. Man, this brother got one hand. One hand. Hey, take me to the other side. Go ahead. Take me to the other side. Carry me where I need to go. I need a lot of help. I need a lot of help in life. Let me tell you something, a value that we have here. Because of these guys, I'm back on my feet, and we can do infinitely more together than we ever could alone. Amen, everybody? Give it up for these guys right here. Man, that's good. <laughs> good job, guys. That was really, that was really nervous for me. <laughs> I was actually pretty ner nervous about that. Luckily, we had a little bit of practice earlier. Have you ever been the one carried through a tough season? Let's bring it right back down to the serious. Have you ever been the one? Have you ever been the one when, when someone was there for you? Someone cared about you? Someone, someone took time out of their day to take care of you, and you've been in pain, or you lost something, you lost someone Someone, it was just, they were just there for you. What I'm saying, church, let's be that person for the people around us. It's time to make this normal in Lifeline Church. It's time to make life groups because that's our strategy. We want to have lots of life groups happening all the time. It's our strategy. There's lots of different ways we could do it. That's our strategy, though. We want to meet in life groups all throughout the city, all throughout the week, because the Bible says they met from the temple week to week, but they met in their homes all throughout the week. That's, it's, we believe it's biblical and very strategic. It's God's way. It's God's plan. It can look a lot of different ways. It can look impromptu. It can look, but we're, we're going to go for it. We're not going to leave it up to chance. We're going for this. We're going we're gonna, to we're gonna work towards it and try and get people close to Jesus. Let's make this normal in Lifeline Church. Make it something that everybody's doing. Why? Because everyone's broken? No. Not because everyone's broken. Because we, but we all need help from time to time, and it's our turn to pick up the mat and be there for others. It might only be one broken person in the group, but the rest of us who are all right, you're there for them. It's not just about you. 
sign up for a life. Well, I don't need it. Well, well, maybe you don't right now, but you might. And maybe somebody there does need it. They need it. They need you. Pick up the mat. Don't be like the Pharisees that, that looked on and were too busy judging what's going on to just, to just be there, to just help, to just see the wisdom and that Jesus was here trying to show us over and over again in different ways. Stand up. Don't leave the mat. Pick it up. Go make disciples, and I'll be with you. Peter, do you love me? Feed my sheep. So what do, what do we do? In your notes, these are, these are blanks that will, help, that will help you. These are, these are some next steps for you. Connect yourself to Jesus. Connect yourself to Jesus. Now listen, you're, you're not carrying anybody if you don't have Jesus, all right? I'm going to just make it clear, and yes, you're right. If you don't have Jesus, there's not much you can do for the needs and nurture of people. You need to take care of that first. And if you feel that you're on the mat today, I want to tell you as your pastor and as your shepherd under Jesus, Jesus is our shepherd, the great shepherd, but I'm a, I'm a shepherd over you though. I've been given, I've been given charge and I've been appointed to take care of you. So as your shepherd, as your pastor, as your friend, I just want to tell you, I want to look at your face and tell you, you are loved, you are cared for, and I'm going to do everything in my power to make sure this is a place where you receive the help and healing and hope that you need. And God has not forgotten about you. He is not tired. If it's been like 10 times, he's not tired of you. Every time you come back, he comes running to you. We've all been there. We've all been there. And we need help at one time or another. Don't be ashamed to put your name on that card and sign up for a group, even if you're nervous or anxious about it, and get into a life-giving group that will bless you. And if that is you, if you need to connect to Jesus, I want to pray for you personally today. I'm going to pray a salvation prayer at the end of this message. I do it every week, every week. But also, I'll, I'll just be hanging out up front. And if you want to wait for me, I'll pray for you personally. I would, I would be honored to do that if you need it. I just wanted to let you know that today. You need to connect yourself to Jesus. This is a place where that happens. This is a place where Jesus wants to meet you. Number two is this. Connect people to Jesus. Connect people to Jesus. How do we do that? Give them the Wi-Fi password. <laughs> Help them connect. Sign up for a life group, but don't stop there. Bring a friend. Bring a friend. <laughs> it's not just about you anymore. There's people out there. They need you to pick up their mat so they can get close enough to Jesus so they can be healed. It's not just about you. You're doing good. Congratulations. High five. Now go out there and help somebody. Get close to Jesus. It's as simple as bringing them to a life group. There are cards on every chair, and there's some empty chairs left in this room. So what I want you to do, pick up one of those. You're filling out one for yourself, but pick up the empty one next to you. Put your friend's name on it. All right? I'm telling be the kind of friend that'd be like, come on, we're going. Come on. You know the kind of friend? Come on. Come on. I know, but I don't want to. Come on. Come on. This is going to be good for us. Come on. Let's go. Come on. You're gonna, we're going to like it, and if we don't like it, we'll not like it together. Come on. Be a, be a friend. Be that kind of friend. Be a lifeline kind of friend. You know the ones that, that won't take no for an answer when they know, when they know this is going to bless you, when they know it's going to help. You're coming with me. Be the friend that jumps into the water and carries people out in one arm and swimming with the other arm and saves their lives. It's not good enough to yell from the shore, hey, it's nice and dry out here. Obviously, I'd be there if I knew how to get myself out of this. But I'm just treading water. I'm like, G -g 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 -g. I'm trying to, trying to get up. Be the one that goes out, gets a little wet, gets a little muddy. Be the one that goes out of your way. So don't just sign yourself up. Bring a friend. It's funner anyways. It's funner. That's not a word. It doesn't matter. I'm good at talking. <sighs> oh, they don't have to be church people. I, want, I needed to say that out loud. They don't have to be church people. They can be your coworkers who don't even, they don't even know Jesus. They could be your neighbors that don't even know Jesus. Matter of fact, there is a lot of people who have come to this church because of life groups, because we've done this, because they've, they've seen things and gone to the life groups, and they certainly do not have to be saved. They do not have to be. That's what homes are for. People are going to come into your living room, have a little food or whatever, have a little chit-chat, whatever. They'll enjoy that. They'll come to that, and then they can figure out, hey, maybe church isn't full of a bunch of weirdos. 
you'd be surprised what people think about us. They don't know that it's just, we're just trying to love on people. We're trying to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength and love our neighbor as ourselves. That's what we do. We're not weird. We just, we love people. Sometimes it's a little outgoing. <laughs> Sometimes when we praise, you know, we raise our hands and get a little rowdy. That's okay. That's okay. In your home, they're going to get acclimated to you and get, begin to understand that you care about them. Peter, do you love me? Number three is this. Um, commit to the connection. Commit to connection. There's no such thing as a good relationship without commitment. No such thing. Without commitment, relationship dies momentarily. It's like a plant without sunlight. It won't survive. There is no such thing as a great relationship without commitment. Why do you think we, you know, we lean in when we're talking about dating and marriage and all that stuff? It's like that commitment level is so important because it shows the other person, like, I'm not going anywhere. I'm committed to this. I'm committed to you, right? And when we feel that from each other, not just in dating, not just in, just in general and with friendships, people feel that, that even if I make a mistake, even if I screw up, even if I'm kind of acting a fool, even if I haven't had any food today and been fasting for 21 days, <laughs> that the person across from me is committed to me, that they're not, not just going to up and leave and be like, oh, I don't like you today, so I'm out. No, commit to each other. Commit to this. See the importance. Commit to it. Commit to your family, your loved ones. That's obvious. But your church family is where a lot of people miss out on most on what God is doing for you. See, when I moved to town, you know, because I was in jails, institutions, and uh, addiction, and it was a really rough go for me when I was a young adult, um, and I got shipped to Stockton to, to get free from drugs. Can you believe that? It, it worked, and it worked. And so the people that I met here in this church, they were my mothers. My family wasn't around. They were my mothers and my fathers, and I met brothers and sisters, even some nieces and nephews, and my, my family, my church became my family. You know, this is supposed to be like a family. We're supposed to be like a family with one another. And I experienced that. And when people don't commit to, to this, because it's so like going to the show sometimes. And we forget that this is our family. And we forget on what God intended. You know what else Jesus said to Peter? On this rock, I'll build my church. You know what the church is? The people. The people. It's God's plan to be committed to this not forsaking the people, your people at home, but this is a family. We're committed to each other. We're committed to each other. We saw this with Jethro talking to Moses. He said, what you're doing is not good. You're going to burn yourself out. Break people up into groups so they can be taken care of. In Acts 6, when the church was blowing up, growing, uh, the, the disciples said, man, we have to break things up and get more people and taken care of. It's all Old Testament, New Testament. It's all throughout the Bible. Can you see it? We're, we're designed, created by God to live this way with each other, not independent, interdependent. Commit to connection. And you know who committed to connection with us? Jesus, the Father who sent his son, that while we were still sinners, one of my favorite passages in the entire Bible, because while I was still a sinner, ooh, while I was still a sinner in county jail, and I didn't know anything about God because I wasn't raised in church, didn't know anything. Holy Spirit met me. He met me. While I was a sinner, I was a sinner. I wasn't saved. I hadn't even repented. I was barely, I still had it in my blood. And God met me, sent his spirit to be in me and gave me that little whisper. Take the help. Take the rehabilitation. It was just a little, just a tiny. God, while we were still sinners, God sent his son. Christ died for us before you got your act together. Before you got your act together. He's, he's more committed than we will ever be. I want to give every single person here an opportunity. It doesn't matter if you're qualified. It doesn't matter if you feel worth it. it doesn't matter if you feel worthy. If you're just ready to receive... If you're just ready to receive that, that unconditional love that changes us, it's his grace that leads us to repentance. His grace met me in a jail cell. 
And it led me to repentance. It wasn't because, because I started wearing button-down shirts and white shoes. His grace on me. If you're ready to receive that grace today, if you need it, if you need to commit yourself to the Lord today, don't miss this opportunity. If you need to commit or if you need to recommit, you know, you, you know, it's in here. This is the Holy Spirit's time right now. This is less me, more him. He's speaking to you. He's inside just, just talking to you. It's normal. Let's normalize that. God speaks to his people, and he might even be encouraging you from the inside. Pray this prayer. Pray this prayer. Take a step today. January 29th, this is your time. Come on. God knew this day was coming. He's not surprised by it. If you're ready to commit or recommit, I'm going to give you an opportunity right now. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes together. It's a private moment. Let's, let's make this private for everyone. If that's you, and Lord, before I even start asking, I pray for open hearts and open minds. Open spiritual eyes to see that you're right in front of us with your hand out, eagerly waiting for us to take this step. If that's you today, would you just lift your hand and show me that you're ready. Amen. Amen. Come on, it's, it's your time. Amen, amen, amen. Oh, precious daughter, I see you. Amen, I see you too. Let's pray this prayer together. Father, thank you for sending your son to die on a cross for my sin. Thank you for forgiving me. Fill me with your spirit and show me the path that I should walk. In Jesus' name. Amen. Can we celebrate for everyone who made that decision today?